I hope this will be not only interesting, but also useful. This will be a discussion about premillennialism and preterism. This evening, I will act as moderator, directing the debate. Firstly, I'd like to say a few words about our participants, who will be presenting today, as well as the rules for our debate. Today we have two brothers presenting. They are Dr. Igal German and Val Miranyuk. I'll say a couple of words about both of them. Dr. Igal German is a founder of the International Biblical Apologetics Association. He is a professor of Old Testament studies with a PhD from St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, as well as BA and MA degrees from the University of Haifa, Israel. Egal teaches Bible courses in Moody Bible Institute, Trinity Christian College, and Shiloh University. Currently, Egal is ministering in a Russian-speaking Messianic community in Chicago, Illinois. At the same time, he acts as an assistant for Dr. Michael Brown. Today, he will be presenting the view of premillennialism. He will be explaining what it means and how we can best understand it. As you know, today we are discussing eschatology, regarding the book of Revelation, and about what was revealed concerning the future. What does the future hold for us? How can we properly understand the book of Revelation and the subjects it touches on? Good day. I greet you all, my friends, and all who participate in our discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Since my time is limited, I will begin right away. I will begin by saying that I accepted preterism relatively recently. It was seven years ago. Before that, I was a futurist and believed in the literal coming of Christ in the future. I studied this topic for a long time, delving deep and approaching it from various perspectives. My study of preterism caused me to reconsider most of my previous opinions about prophecies. I continue to study this subject even today. A quick review, or rather an introduction of what we are talking about here, I assume that not everyone watching us is an expert in theological terminology, such as futurism, preterism, idealism, and historicism. Therefore, I would briefly define what we are talking about. A teaching most popular among Christians about the coming of Christ is the teaching of futurism. What is futurism? Futurism means that all prophecies about Jesus Christ are yet to be fulfilled in the future. So we must expect the coming of Christ in the future. The Antichrist will come in the future. The Third Temple will be built in the future. And all events associated with Jesus Christ are to come in the future. That is described by futurism. Futurism also implies that we shouldn't wait for anything good to come, since the coming of Christ will bring with itself many problems. There will be great sorrow, there will be the Antichrist, there will be catastrophes, there will be Gog and Magog, there will be many problems on planet Earth, stars will fall, the Earth will burn, and so on. All of this is described by futurism as that which is meant to come. However, this teaching of futurism is shared by three categories of Christians, and my opponent, in fact, belongs to one of these categories. So there are three categories of futurist Christians. Their teaching is currently the most widespread and most popular. They believe in the coming of Christ in the following ways. The first category believes that Christ will come before the Great Tribulation. The second category believes that Christ will come in the middle of the Great Tribulation. And the third category believes that Christ will come at the end of the Great Tribulation. All these three categories share the belief of futurism. However, apart from futurism, there are some other beliefs among the Christians. These are less known, but no less widespread. One of these beliefs is historicism. Popular preachers such as John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon subscribe to this belief. This belief of historicism was developing during the Middle Ages, also during the 15th, 16th, and up until the 20th centuries. What does historicism say? Historicism describes current events by associating them with biblical prophecies. For example, Martin Luther believed that the Roman Pope was the Antichrist. Also, Napoleon was believed to be the Antichrist. Also today, many people associate current events with biblical prophecies. On one hand, they do partially share the belief of preterism, and on the other hand, believe that the biblical prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. Also, there is idealism. This belief describes all prophecies in the book of Revelation as being only allegorical in nature. This belief is sometimes known as the spiritual perspective. So all things described in the book of Revelation are an allegory and should not be taken literally. However, this belief has a problem since John writes that the things he writes will come, so they must be fulfilled. The last belief which I present is preterism. Preterism describes all biblical prophecies 
Preterism describes all biblical prophecies concerning the Israel, the Church, and mankind in general as having been fulfilled already by the year 70 AD. When I say year 70 AD, I don't mean an exact date, but rather a general period of the destruction of the temple and the beginning of a new epoch. How did I come to this? I want to say that every preterist used to be a futurist before, so they used to believe that Jesus Christ should come in the future. How did it begin for me? I'd like to tell you the story. It all began with me reading the well-known chapter from the book of Matthew, chapter 24. I read the words of Christ when he sat with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. Peter asked the question, Tell us, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They were sitting on the Mount of Olives and looking at the temple when Jesus told them, The time will come when nothing will be left from the temple. All will be destroyed. It was when the disciples were admiring the temple that Jesus told them not to be so transfixed, for nothing will remain. Peter was so touched by these words that later, when they sat on the Mount of Olives, he asked Jesus this question. I didn't give much thought to this until one time I asked myself, what exactly was it that Peter asked? I'll repeat this question. Tell us, when will this happen, i.e. the destruction of the temple, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. My friends, I want to direct your attention to the following. At the time, Peter, who asked this question, knew nothing about the death of Christ, nor about his crucifixion, nor about his resurrection, nor about his second coming. They believed that Jesus was supposed to establish God's kingdom on earth. Remember how Peter asked before the ascension of Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were not thinking in the same way as we do today. Then we can ask, what exactly did Peter inquire of Jesus, since he knew nothing about the second coming, the death of Jesus, and did not even think about his crucifixion nor about the resurrection? Peter only knew about the first coming of the Christ, the Messiah, and expected him to restore the kingdom of Israel. So what was the real question of Peter? Secondly, what was the answer of Jesus? Because all of the prophecies written in Matthew 24 describe the events of the last time, namely the falling stars, the heavens shaking, famines, plagues, and the like, all of this describes the last time. That's what the churches preach, that it'll happen in our days, in the future. Yet that's not what the question was about. Peter knew nothing about the second coming, so what was Jesus talking about? That was my first question when I started studying preterism. So firstly, what actually happened? I found an answer for myself. The end of the world, herein described, is actually the end of an epoch. The end of this period. It was meant to come at the end of the law, the destruction of the temple. The epoch of the law is over. Since the historical events taking place around 70 AD were not written down in the scriptures, many Christians miss out on what actually happened. The history written by Joseph Flavius about the conquest and destruction of Jerusalem doesn't describe just a historical event of conquest, such as the fall of Troy or Carthage, and it is not just the last chapter of ancient Israel, not at all. What happened around the year 70 AD was the fulfillment of many prophecies. Those events affected the whole of mankind. It was like a rebirth. For this reason, the Bible talks about these events so often and so colorfully. Those descriptions of beasts that appear in the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel appear so terrifying and dramatic to most readers because it all recounts a great catastrophe, which it was a catastrophe indeed. Think about it. The population was 260 million at the time of Christ, and this war took the lives of a million or more than two million. That will be an approximation. I may be a little off. So it was a great conflict on par with a world war. It is a war that is hard for us to imagine. The numbers don't seem so large to us today. That is because our population has increased. It wasn't just a war with large numbers. It formed a new world, a new time, a new epoch. The time of Moses, which began with the power and thunder at Mount Sinai, is over. About 16 centuries of the Mosaic Epoch, the Epoch of Law, have come to a conclusion. It was with Moses that the rules of relationship between man and God were established and brought to a natural conclusion here. The temple was destroyed, and the ministry of angels also discontinued. So the glory and crown of Mosaic ministry has come to a conclusion. Mount Sinai, the Holy of Holies, Mount Zion, the Sacred Mountain, the dwelling of the Lord, the wonderful house, all of it was over in an instant. Now it begins a new period, a new epoch, 
the epoch of grace, the epoch of faith. This is what we mean when we say the end of the world or the end of the age. It means the end of the epoch of law. Let's open the passage from Hebrews 9.26 where it says the following, He would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Notice that Jesus dies on the cross, and that is during the end of the ages. Other versions say end of the world or the last time, also culmination of the ages. What sort of end of ages or end of the world does it refer to when it mentions the death of Christ? It explicitly says that he died at the end of the world or at the culmination of ages. This is not the end of the world of planet Earth, not by any means. It is the end of the epoch of the Old Testament. All verses that mention Jesus speaking to the people, like when he says, This generation shall not pass. These verses describe that generation, those people, living in that period. I want to say that this doctrine of preterism is not as hopeless as some people assume. Whenever I talk about preterism, most people tell me that I'm teaching something new. However, that's not the case. Preterism is not a new concept, and in fact, it is an ancient idea. In fact, it predates futurism. Futurism and the modern doctrine about the Great Tribulation, taught in many churches today, appeared relatively recently, in the 18th or 19th century. Before that, the Church of the Middle Ages rather accepted the concept of historicism. But if you look even farther in the past, the early fathers of the Church of the 3rd century had preterist schools. They imagined Nero as the Antichrist, and so on. So the teaching about the second coming of Christ that we have right now is a new teaching. Meanwhile, preterism, if you look at its roots, is instead an ancient teaching. Also, it is no coincidence that the modern concept of preterism is becoming widespread. That is because it preaches about completion. When I found out about preterism, many puzzle pieces came together. So many things that I could not explain before are starting to make sense now. That is because preterism and grace go hand in hand. If we believe the words of Jesus spoke on the cross, it is finished. If we believe that our salvation, redemption, and sanctification are completed, then it all goes together with preterism, and we have something good to look forward to. Some people, after having heard that I now preach preterism, have sent me the following. Isn't preterism a hopeless doctrine? If the coming of Christ happened and the apocalypse is over, what are we doing here? People tell me this because they think the world is only getting worse and worse. Everyone is becoming wicked. There is more evil in the world. However, such belief actually discourages the people from making this world and their lives better. Who would waste their effort? Who would do anything if they knew that the world would burn? If they knew that tomorrow there would be nothing. What is the point of putting hope into generations that your children or grandchildren would live in a better world? What is the point of looking into the future if everything that you do today will be worthless tomorrow? Preterism gives you confidence that you contribute to the growth and stability of the kingdom of God in the world, that you have significance for the generation. Your work will have weight and value. It will not be empty, nor will it lose its worth. A primary distinction between preterism and futurism is that futurism believes that all the positive changes will take place in a matter of one day after the Great Tribulation. So a great catastrophe will happen. All those global events will take place. And then the millennial kingdom begins. And only then will good come, along with joy, peace, etc. Preterism, on the other hand, says all these changes are already happening. The kingdom of God has already come. The world is getting better. You are already resurrected. Your bodies are already transformed. You are now able to experience a better, transformed world. The kingdom of God can become part of our planet now, and it is interesting to imagine this world in 500 years, especially since we know the kingdom of God can influence this world. Wars will end, poverty will end, illnesses will end. You might call this wishful thinking, I call it the promise of the Bible. If you listen to Steven Pinker, the professor of cognitive science, the study of the human mind, he tells us very interesting things. According to him, if you look into history, even recently, the average human lifespan was under 30 years. Nowadays, it's 70, 80 in the more developed countries. 250 years, a third of the children did not live past five years old, even in the richest countries. Nowadays, child mortality has decreased a hundred times. Famine, one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, wrought devastation in every corner of the world. Nowadays, famine has almost disappeared. 
90% of the population was malnourished in the past. Nowadays, this number dropped to 10%. The world was never more democratic than the last decade. Two-thirds of the human population live in democratic countries. Murder rate is falling. Truly, our world is getting better. And I trust that these expectations, a belief of preterism, will make our lives better. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Val, for your presentation. You have finished perfectly on time. Now, Igal German will make his presentation and will present his side. Igal German, your 20 minutes will begin as soon as you start speaking. Greetings, my friends. I thank Val for presenting his perspective. I want to show my PowerPoint presentation and we'll begin discussing the topic. The topic of our discussion is, was or will there be a second coming of Christ? The questions we'll be addressing are the following. What awaits us in the future? How to correctly understand Bible prophecy about the second coming of Jesus Christ? What is preterism and is it biblical? Presented by the International Biblical Apologetics Association. You can see our website here. Let us begin with the following three questions. The first question, what awaits us in the future? Second, how to correctly understand Bible prophecy about the second coming of Jesus Christ? And the third question, what is preterism and is it biblical? I have a couple of key questions I want to ask Val as a preterist and anyone else sharing this view. The Bible promises a bodily resurrection at the end of the age. 1 Corinthians 15 teaches about the future bodily resurrection from the dead, along with the transformation of those who are still living. As stated in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, If the rapture happened in 70 CE, then the resurrection is already in the past. Didn't Hymenaeus and Philetus say the same thing, the resurrection is already in the past? In 2 Timothy 2.16-18. The next question, Who are the two witnesses in the book of Revelation chapter 11? Can you name them? Did their miracles occur in history? When were they resurrected and taken to heaven? In Revelation 11, 9 to 12, it says, Now after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. When did it happen? Next question, where is the third temple where the Antichrist will be worshipped as God? This is written in Matthew 24, 15, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4 speaks about the man of lawlessness and the man of sin. Next, when did the Jewish people weep for Yeshua, whom they pierced, as stated in Zechariah 12.10? When did Yeshua defeat the nations and the Antichrist? We read about that in Matthew 24.21-23. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be, except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if anyone says to you, Look, here is Christ, or there, do not believe it. Does this sound like what has already happened? When did the event described in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 and 26 take place? And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. When were the words of Jesus Christ written in Matthew 24, 29, fulfilled? Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Preterists claim that Jesus returned in the year 70 CE. Did everyone see him walking on the clouds in 70 CE? We read the following prophecy in Matthew 24, 30. Notice what the Lord is saying. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Mark 8, 38 tells us, the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. Furthermore, in the very last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verse 7, we read the following words, Behold, He, who is Christ, is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, Amen. When did the inhabitants of the earth mourn or see Him? Or perhaps we are still expecting this to be fulfilled in the future? Next question. Revelation chapter 16 verses 18 to 19 says, And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, 
such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of nations fell. What city is being mentioned in Revelation chapter 11? It is Jerusalem. Look at Revelation chapter 11, 8. Did an earthquake in Jerusalem kill 7,000 people, make others fearful, and bring glory to God in 70 AD? For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. How could this be fulfilled by the Roman army in 70 AD? Zechariah predicts a worldwide battle against Jerusalem, not a localized one. What is Israel doing on earth if all those prophecies already took place? Where is King David? Where is the new temple? Next question. Did Armageddon happen in 70 AD? Did Jesus come a second time? We read in the Old Testament that all nations will attack Israel, but God will fight for that city and will destroy them all in the Valley of Megiddo. When did this happen? The Bible says that the lawless one, the Antichrist, will reign and be killed by the second coming of Christ. Apostle Paul has written the following in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Furthermore, did we ever see the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4? The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Pay special attention to verse 4. He, meaning the Lord, shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against another nation, neither shall they learn war. Are we seeing this in our life or have we ever witnessed anything of the like in history? Next question. Did we ever see the fulfillment of Isaiah Chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now let's see if another key prophecy has been fulfilled. Let us look at the sermon of Apostle Peter in the book of Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Here Peter is addressing his fellow Jews, saying, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He then quotes Deuteronomy chapter 18. Where is Jesus? In heaven or on earth? Did everything begin to be restored? No, because Jesus has yet not returned. He will come. Next question. Has Jesus separated the sheep and the goats? Why are the goats still around? Where are the immortal resurrected believers, if we indeed live in the millennial kingdom? Can you name me at least one person? Is Satan bound, if indeed Jesus came in 70 AD and a millennium has already passed? Our conclusion? Jesus did not return in 70 AD. We read the following promise given by the angels when Jesus was ascending from the Mount of Olives. Acts chapter 1 verse 11. This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. His feet have not yet stood on the Mount of Olives a second time. The battle of Armageddon and the Great Tribulation will yet occur in the future. The two witnesses from Revelation 11 will appear in the future. None of this happened. Are we to change the scriptures about those events? So, what awaits us in the future, according to the teaching of the scripture? Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, lived a perfect life, died for our sins on the cross at Calvary, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and will return once more from heaven to earth in a visible manner and a glorified body. And his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. 
you can see that the Bible clearly teaches about these events. So, the position that I represent in this debate is called premillennialism. What does it mean? Premillennialism is the belief that Jesus Christ will physically return to earth, establish a throne in Jerusalem, and will reign over the whole earth for a thousand years. The main reason for adopting premillennialism is that the Bible explicitly teaches it. You can find concrete passages from the Old and the New Testaments that distinctly teach this biblical eschatology. So what awaits us in the future according to the Word of God? We know that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, will come from the heavens. He will come with clouds. The scripture tells us how the people of Jerusalem will see him. They will weep that they once rejected him. He will return to the nation of Israel. The people will repent and receive him. The Lord told us in Matthew's chapter 23, verse 39, that these people will say in the future, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These words have not been spoken by the people of Israel ever in the history of the world. The people of Israel haven't welcomed Yeshua yet. There will also be the judgment day in the future. The Lord tells us about it in Matthew chapter 25, verses 32 to 46. He will separate the sheep and the goats. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 to 26 is a key prophecy still waiting to be fulfilled. Apostle Paul writes the following, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. He is speaking to the Christians converted from non-Jews. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This prophecy has definitively not been fulfilled yet. We shall pray for the salvation of Israel, the house of Jacob, and that salvation will come to the house of Jacob. When our Lord God shall return, Yeshua HaMashiach, the King of the Jews, we are still waiting for the fulfillment of the great prophecy. When the Lord himself will come from the heavens, and every eye shall behold him. In Revelation chapter 19, we see a vision of the one who is called Faithful and True, sitting on a white horse. With justice, he judges and wages war. The scripture calls him the Word of God. He is our Savior. We notice that the hosts of heaven followed him on white horses. A two-sided sword comes from his mouth in order to overcome the nations. When did this happen? Never. Believers have a wonderful hope in the return of our Savior from heaven. Who is our Lord? He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeshua from Nazareth is God Yahweh who came in the flesh. A couple of more prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled are written in Isaiah 9-7. Of the increase of his, Messiah's, government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with the judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 through 6, it says that a king shall reign who is a descendant of David. He will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. This is yet to happen in the future, my friends. Here it says that Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Also, the first chapter of Luke, we read the words of angel Gabriel spoken to Mary, foretelling the birth of the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, into this world. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Here it declared that the Lord will sit on the throne of David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, which is the Jewish nation. This has never happened, but it will, for the Lord told us this through his angel Gabriel. What promises does the Lord give to us, his children, his church, we read that if we endure, we will also reign with him. We will reign with him if we persevere. Also, we can observe the great new song sung by the holy children of God, in which they glorify the Lord. They sing these words, written in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. I want to direct your attention to this part. And have redeemed us to God, by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. They will reign on earth. That is yet to happen. In Revelation chapter 20, 
It speaks about the millennial kingdom of Christ, which will arrive in the future. Here, it speaks about those who will be resurrected in the second resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. So, about the Eucharist and the second coming of Christ, when we celebrate the Christ as the Passover sacrifice, when we proclaim his death for our sins and his future return, this is what we call the Eucharist, the Holy Communion. Pay attention to the words of Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In other words, by participating in the Eucharist, we are waiting for his future return. If God will not come again, then there practically is no reason to do the Eucharist anymore. But it says, until he comes. He will come for his church. There will be the rapture of the church, which the word of God tells us about. Golden Rules for Biblical Interpretation We need to remember that one of the golden rules is interpreting the word of God according to its concrete, direct, literal message. This is the golden rule of literal interpretation. You can notice that the premillennial eschatology is based on the literal interpretation of the word of God, paying attention to the grammatical and historical context that is provided to us in the scripture. The second golden rule is progressive interpretation. Notice that whatever God reveals to us, he never changes, but only expands, clarifies, and deepens our understanding. It is important to note that the spirit of preterism already existed in the first church, and this spirit was not from God. Preterists don't accept the truth of God's word. There are several examples, like in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-4, through 4, where we read the following. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. They will say, Where is the promise of his coming? The preterists say the same thing, since they do not believe in the future return of God's Son from heaven. Apostle Paul warned us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17-18, through 18, And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Preterists teach false doctrine. Apostle Paul also warned us in the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-4, through 4, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. God protect us from this delusion, and let him strengthen us with his word. Amen. All right, thank you, Egal. Now, dear brothers, we'll give ten minutes to Val so he can respond to Egal's arguments. It would be hard to respond since many questions were raised. Egal practically quoted 20 or 30 verses from the Bible, and I studied and researched each one of them. If I had more time, I could address every verse from the preterist perspective. There is no contradiction here. They can be explained harmoniously, and the answers could be found. Certainly, I searched for answers and found them. However, since there were so many, for 10 minutes out of 20 it were just the verses, even if I tried answering each verse in only one minute, that would take me 20 minutes. That would be impossible. Therefore, I would select only some verses that were presented and address them. Meanwhile, the rest I can address in the chat for those that are interested or in the following Q&A or you can come visit my website. There you will be able to find the answers for those verses mentioned by Egal. There is one verse that Egal brought up, both in the beginning and the end. He was talking about Hymenaeus and Philetius. If we properly study this verse, we will find that these two people were the same ones that Paul wrote about earlier to Timothy. What did he say? He said, Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetius, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. So these people did not study the gospel, and they deceived the people. Furthermore, they persecuted Apostle Paul. They have actively opposed his sermons. For example, we read in 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Alexander once represented the Jews by opposing Paul's ministry. We read in Acts chapter 19, verse 33, And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. This is the same Alexander here. 
Looking at these people, we can find no clear indication that they were Christians at all. These people may have heard about the scriptures, about the gospel, about grace. Therefore, the faith that they rejected in their lives was not the faith of grace, but instead a conviction or a set of beliefs that a person adheres to. It was only their views, convictions, and beliefs. It was not the same faith that we adhere to, the faith in Christ. I mean the faith when we believe in Jesus. Therefore, whenever these two people are mentioned, we need to understand the following. Apostle Paul, in his letter to Thessalonians, was talking about, it is likely that the letter to Timothy was written after the letter to Thessalonians. Paul was talking about how this is a wrong belief that Hymenaeus and Philetius teach. They were around in the year 52 AD. Among people and among Christians, in his letter to Thessalonians, Apostle Paul wrote that you must not believe in what they say, that the day of the Lord already happened. So what is happening? These two people are claiming that the day of the Lord took place. It means that they have nothing to fear. Meanwhile, Paul was warning people, saying, Pay attention, because soon the judgment day will come. Soon the events of 70 AD will happen. The Roman army will soon come. Soon you will gather your possessions and flee the city, because soon there will be blood, there will be war. Terrible things will happen here. For this reason, you must be prepared. And then these two people arrive and they say, Oh, no, 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 none of this will happen. Resurrection already took place. There will be no day of the Lord. Everything already happened. And that's how they endangered the people. Apostle Paul said, pay attention. The day of the Lord is a biblical term that describes the judgment day. The day of the Lord was also an event of the resurrection of the saints, who are supposed to be gathered by the Lord. This is written in the book of Thessalonians. Paul told them, do not be deceived thinking that the day of the Lord has happened. Don't think this way because you will endanger your life. In chapter 3, verse 9, Paul provides a list of primary observable signs that point to the day of the Lord. He points out what must accompany this day of the Lord. Why is this important? Because if the resurrection happened and the day of the Lord happened, then the believers would start living carelessly. They would not be preparing themselves for the approaching tribulations of 70 AD. And the tribulations would catch them off guard. That's why Paul said not to trust these people. They do not present the true teaching because the danger is coming soon. As we know, all the letters of Paul were written before 70 AD. After all these letters were written, then it all happened. The same applies to the resurrection of the dead. Yes, I do believe that we were resurrected, resurrected by Christ. The word resurrection also means renewal. Jesus Christ revived all of us through his resurrection. For it is written, we are revived in him. We were buried with him. We died with him. And we were revived with him. This is our faith. But how were we revived? Here we can ask whether it was our body, our soul, or our spirit. Why do we believe it is only our soul? When we are talking about the soul, let's remember they can also die. That's what Martin Luther believed and many other saints. They believed that the soul could be put to sleep. It dies in a way. It goes to sleep. And in time of resurrection, the soul is awakened. I do believe that our bodies can be renewed. Times when bodies were resurrected happened not only during the time of Christ's ascension. Bodies were also resurrected before that. When Jesus died, many bodies of the saints rose from the dead and appeared in the city. What sort of resurrection was that? Was it not resurrection? Yes, it was resurrection. Then we can ask the question, are our bodies glorified? My question to you is, what do you mean by a glorified body? Did Jesus not perform the glorification of bodies when he was with his disciples in a boat and in an instant that boat reached the shore? They were transferred over air. Their bodies were virtually glorified. Their bodies were an example. When Jesus appeared to his disciples, passing through walls, barred doors, and shut windows, broke bread, and he ate. That food entered him. That was a glorified body. When he passed through a wall, that food did not remain stuck on the wall. So food was dissolved in his body. It was a glorified body. We find examples of glorified bodies among people from the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. It happened not only after resurrection, but also before. The disciples were transferred together with Jesus while they were in a boat, which means that their bodies were transferred. Is this not an example of glorified bodies? These are the couple of points that I wanted to make. I want to say that if we want to talk about the first and second resurrections, I have a separate sermon prepared, a separate outline of points. It's a grand subject, what do the first and second resurrections mean? In reality, it's only one. 
Christ said that when people will arise from the dead, some will rise to life and others to judgment. It was one resurrection that had two directions, one to life and to death. But resurrection was one. However, in the Old Testament, once a person died, their soul went to sleep. They were waiting for resurrection. They were in Sheol. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our souls no longer go to Sheol, nor do they go to hell. They no longer fall asleep. They don't die. They immediately ascend to join our Heavenly Father. In this sense, we are instantly transferred to God, and we already sit with God in heaven. We are already revived. Therefore, if the saints of the Old Testament died, their souls went to sleep and waited for resurrection. Then in the New Testament, death is only a passing, and the souls go directly to heaven. In that sense, we do not need a separate resurrection. We will not be laying in our graves waiting until Christ comes and raises us from the dead. We will be with God instantly. I will be transported to him immediately after death. If you want to, Egal, you can join me. I invite everyone. It is possible that we wouldn't even die, that is, if we believe correctly. The Bible speaks very little about death. It is no mistake that in Judaism, death is considered impure. The Bible talks a lot about life. Therefore, I do believe that our bodies can serve as examples of glorified bodies. Abraham, who was renewed in his body, was it not a case of a glorified body? Sarah, whose body was renewed, was that not an example of a glorified body? How about Joshua and Caleb? Was their case not an example of a glorified body? Yes, these were all examples of glorified bodies. When people became young, attractive, and strong, that is the sort of resurrection we can portray in Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Val, for your answer. Egal, it is your turn. You have ten minutes to respond. Thank you, Val. I would like to address a couple of points from Val's speech. First of all, the theology of futurism was portrayed very negatively, as if it was absolutely pessimistic. That is not the case. Biblical eschatology does predict the coming of tribulations, suffering, but God promises a way out. God promises to come and restore everything. So Val did not present an objective view of futurism. This is my first point. Second, the scripture clearly teaches that the Great Tribulation has not yet started. The three-year siege of Jerusalem that led to the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD was a tragedy in Jewish history. However, it never reached the level of global calamity. It was an ultimately localized event that concerned only one nation. It was a localized situation taking place in Jerusalem that saw the destruction of the Temple and the city. Christ said that if those days were not cut short, then no one would survive. Clearly, it speaks not about the destruction of the second temple, but about a future event that has not yet been experienced by mankind on planet Earth. The next conclusion that Val made, he claimed that Peter knew nothing about the future restoration of the Israel and the return of Yeshua from heaven to Earth. That assertion is incorrect. Since the end of Matthew chapter 23, the Lord said that the Jerusalemites will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was said in Matthew chapter 23, and in the 24th chapter, Peter and other disciples ask, When will this happen? The destruction of the temple and the end of the ages. So they saw a connection between these two events. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ predicted the events that will happen in the future. Next, it was claimed that the epoch of the law had ended. Val's preterist position implies replacement theology. The Bible does not teach replacement theology. The Bible does not teach that God has ended his covenant relationship with Israel. The Bible teaches that God still has a plan for the Jewish people and the nations. Preterism is founded on replacement theology. In Matthew 5, Yeshua said, Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Heaven and earth will pass, but God's words won't. The Lord clearly and definitively tells us that His eternal plan for His nation and the deep meaning that permeate the Tanakh, the Torah, and the whole scripture will remain immovable until the moment that heaven and earth shall pass. We still live on earth, and there is heaven above us. So this has not been fulfilled yet. In accordance with the scriptures, I believe that the promise of God pertaining to the church and Israel are yet to be fulfilled in this future. About the next claim, the destruction of the second temple in the city of Jerusalem was somehow representative of the end of an age. Preterism lacks biblical foundation. The second destruction of the temple was indeed a great tragedy of the Jewish nation. It was God's punishment without a doubt. However, let's look at what the Lord says in Luke 21. I want to focus your attention to the following words that pertain to the city of Jerusalem. The Lord said this in Luke 21. 
It is a very important passage in the context of the second temple being destroyed and whether God has abandoned this city and his promises to the nation. Luke 21, verse 24. Here the Lord reveals the events that will happen 40 years after Yeshua has spoken of them while he was on earth. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. This is exactly what happened to the Jewish nation. It continues, And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We know that the Gentiles still trample Jerusalem, and they will trample Jerusalem more in the final events of the last time. This is clearly yet to be fulfilled, and the times of the Gentiles are yet not over. Next, Val mentioned the ministry of the angels. I do not understand what ministry of angels Val had in mind. Next, he mentioned Hebrews 9.26. It speaks there about our salvation by the means of Yeshua's sacrifice. Yes and amen. I believe in that sacrifice and accept it with my whole heart. Yeshua is my Lord, God, and Savior. The fact that Yeshua will come a second time to establish a millennial kingdom does not contradict with him already having completed our salvation in the cross of cavalry. Next, it was claimed that this generation of which Yeshua spoke, that this generation will not pass until all is fulfilled only pertains to the generation living in the first century A.D. A deeper study of these passages, Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 35, and Luke chapter 21, verses 29 through 32, reveals that it is the very last Jewish generation that is being mentioned. There, it speaks about the signs of the fig tree. There is a specific wording that I would like you to see. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Notice, my friends, what it says here. It speaks about a fig tree, which symbolizes the people of Israel. We see that God blessed the restoration of Israel, a modern country. 1948 served as a sign of God, the founding of the state of Israel. Therefore, we can clearly see that the generation Yeshua mentioned is not the one from the first century AD, but instead the very last generation of the Jewish nation living right before his second coming. It was also claimed that in the early church, fathers taught preterism, I studied this subject and found no support for that claim. We observe instead that the early church sided with the premillennial view. Furthermore, it is also necessary for us to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, where both me and Val have looked at Hymenaeus and Philetius. He claimed that these were some unbelievers that taught a heresy. The context, on the other hand, implies that these were most likely Christians that fell into heresy. They taught that the resurrection had already passed. The spirit of the teaching matches what the preterists say, that the resurrection already happened. We live in the kingdom of God. There will be no millennial kingdom. Christ will not come. There will be no new earth and heaven. God gave us a warning that we do not fall for that deception. Also, the day of the Lord was brought up. In his letter to Thessalonians, Paul warned that those that say the day of the Lord already happened. It is a position of the preterists. And the Holy Spirit warned us through Paul that we do not get deceived. Also, let's consider Val's last statement, that we already have glorified bodies. The New Testament clearly teaches that the resurrected will be given new glorified bodies. At the moment, we do not live in glorified bodies. We spiritually are with God, yes. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says that he already put us in heaven. Indeed, that is our status, our position. But it does not speak about our bodies. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 teaches that the saints will be resurrected and the believers who are alive will be raptured to meet with the Lord in the air. There was no second coming, there were no trumpets, and the voice of the archangel. And all of this will happen in the future. The glorification of the body is an apparent glorification that the New Testament mentioned. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Egal, for your response. Now, Val, you have the last five minutes of our first part to respond to Egal's arguments. About Egal's arguments, I would not be able to answer every question since many were presented in all generalized contexts. For example, the gospel clearly tells us that Christ will come in the future, and it is proven. Proven how? By what? That wasn't clarified. Also, it was said that the early church fathers did not share the view of preterism, but instead shared the view of Egal, a view that appeared in the last 100 or 200 years. These words are empty and require proof. I understand that our debate would not allow for good argumentation with references and data, because this is a live broadcast. Nonetheless, I also studied this topic, and I know what I'm talking about. 
Indeed, futurism is a new teaching that appeared a hundred or maybe two hundred years ago. In either case, it's recent, from the 19th to 20th century. Meanwhile, if we talk about concrete historical dates of the first apologetic studies of preterism, they will be 15th or 16th century. That was when the Catholics tried to justify themselves before the Protestants. That was because the Protestants accused the Roman Pope of being the Antichrist. The Catholics needed to respond, and there came one Jesuit who did respond. He was the first to describe the doctrine of preterism in the 16th century. This is a historical fact. Meanwhile, futurism is a completely new belief. On the topic of the early church fathers, I can look through my notes and find the belief of preterism occurring in earlier times. It is hard to respond right now as we are online. Nonetheless, this is the reality. Now, about Hymenaeus and Philetius, my opponent contended that these were Christians that fell into heresy, despite the fact that I had brought up three verses disputing this, saying that they were not Christians. It seems that he didn't care. Either way, he said that they sowed lies by saying that resurrection already happened. My question is, what resurrection happened? What faith did they destroy? Hymenaeus and Philetius did not believe in the future resurrection. There was no mention of the second coming and raising of the dead. These people did not share the belief of Christianity. Naturally, there was no talk of any future resurrection. So what resurrection did they mean when they said that it already happened? That's the question. This question does not have a solid answer. So if we ask the question, what resurrection did Hymenaeus and Philetius talk about, we get ourselves a big question mark. Is it the same resurrection that Egal speaks about, or is it some other? That's the question. Now about glorified bodies. The apostle said this, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In other words, everything is under Christ's authority. This power which dwells in us, is the same that God exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead. The same power, according to Paul, is in us. He says this so that our eyes are enlightened, that we may realize what revivifying power lives in us. Paul says that with this power, Jesus conquered everything and transformed it. Does this concern our bodies? If everything is in our possession, the riches of his glorious inheritance, his glory in us, is this the glorification of our bodies or only our souls? Why do we restrict the glorification of Christ only to our souls and only to our minds? Meanwhile, the body, we say that it must only hurt, get sick, and die. Who set us these frames? Why are we the ones who set them for ourselves? The same power with which God raised Christ and put him at his right hand above everything, the same power is in our possession, according to Paul. For this reason, I pray that God may open the eyes of everyone, that we may see the reality of glorified bodies. Thank you. Thank you for your response. Now, Egal, you have the last five minutes. Allow me to make a solid response to one of the points brought up by Val. The point about the early church. This will only be an example. For example, concerning the rapture. We know that the teaching about the rapture was widespread in the first century. Indeed, the church was in a state of anticipation. Here's what Arrhenius of Leonis has to say in his work Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 29. And therefore, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said, There shall be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous, in which, when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption, being immortality. So we know that after the Constantine, in the 4th century AD, when the church began to reign by becoming mixed in with politics, this passage was interpreted allegorically. Beginning with the 17th century, it was revealed by Puritans and began to expand. We know that among evangelical Christians, especially among Slavic Baptists, there was the teaching about a future rapture of the church and the founding of God's kingdom on earth. A couple of words about glorified bodies, which Val brought up. 
and want to bring up a couple of passages from the scripture telling us that our bodies will be glorified when we see God face to face, when our Savior will return in the second coming. Let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Here it clearly states that we shall be like Him. We are currently in our earthly, sinful bodies, not yet glorified. But we will be like Him, when we shall be glorified with the Lord, when He shall return in the glory of His Father with His holy angels. Furthermore, as we look into Romans 8, I want to direct your attention to verse 18. Here the Apostle Paul very clearly describes the future of the children of God in the heavenly kingdom. Reading Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, i.e., in the future. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. The whole creation including mankind. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, for we were saved in this hope. Later, Paul continues to expand this topic. Another thing that I wanted to say, God's word teaches that the Lord will return. Let's read Hebrews 9, 28. This is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So a true Christian is the one that waits for his Savior to return. Also, dear friends, it is important to look at how God gave us the Holy Scriptures. The last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation. It has 22 chapters. These 22 chapters describe the events that must happen in the future. The rapture of the church, the resurrection of the dead, the second coming of Yeshua from heaven, salvation of the Jewish nation, also the millennial kingdom and a new heaven and a new earth. The Lord has taken care that the last book of the Bible is written towards the end of the first century AD. It was written after the destruction of the second temple of 70 AD and spoke about the future. Thank you. For those of you that do not know about our ministry, I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is the International Biblical Apologetics Association. The ministry is the International Biblical Apologetics Association. You can find us on Facebook by typing International Biblical Apologetics Association. You will be able to find our groups. We maintain our contacts. Subscribe to our channels. We also have English-speaking channels on YouTube. Please subscribe to the social media platforms and the YouTube channel of the International Biblical Apologetics Association. Please check out our website, BibleApologist.org. Again, that is BibleApologist.org. Now this last part will conclude our debates. This is when each participant will say their closing statement, five minutes each. I think the first one to go should be the one who's more ready. Val, if you're ready, you have five minutes. Thank you. First and foremost, I want to thank you for the wonderfully organized debate. I want to thank Egal for his initiative. Also the moderator, the audience, the participants. I think this debate was very wonderful. I personally enjoyed the conversation, my opponent, the moderator, and the audience too. Basically, everything was well organized. I am emotionally and spiritually satisfied, so thank you all. Perhaps at some point, I was a little aggressive. I'm personally an emotional person, so I don't want anything to be taken personally. That is only my mode of delivery and expression. I want to thank everyone again, and it'll be great if this carries on, bears fruit, and is useful to those that are listening. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Vladimir, for moderating. Thank you to all participants who asked questions. For the last five minutes, I wanted to share a couple more verses that I prepared for this debate concerning preterism. Some of the dangers I see in preterism are the following. Preterism maintains that the entire New Testament was written before 70 AD. I find that claim to be incorrect because the book of Revelation, as far as we know, was written after 70 AD. Most likely, it was written in 90 AD. Key support to that is provided by Irenaeus of Lyons, one of the early apostolic fathers of the early church who lived from... 120 to 202 AD. Lack of historical agreement 
with the Roman invasion of Jerusalem in 70 AD, for example, the direction that Jesus took when entering Jerusalem. Christ's second coming is compared to lightning flashing from the east to the west, but the Roman army, which the preterists interpret as the fulfillment of the prophecy, advanced on Jerusalem from west to east. Even if this is simply taken to mean that the Roman army advanced like lightning, i.e. quickly, history shows a very slow assault on Jerusalem. This war lasted several years before Jerusalem was even besieged. Another historical contradiction to the prophetic fulfillment in the first century is the following. In many cases, correlation can be established through an eschatologically biased interpretation by the first century historian Flavius Josephus. First is associating divine omens with the forthcoming conquest of the Roman army. Second, rethinking the text according to the preferred historical data, such as mistaking clouds of heaven for dust raised by the advance of the Roman army. Third, taking claims that do not fit historical events, such as the unprecedented and unsurpassed nature of the tribulation, as hyperbole to a claim of the first century fulfillment. Even the central concept of preterism, that the coming of Christ was to bring about the end of the Jewish nation, cannot stand in light of the continued existence of the Jews as a people and the modern state of Israel. If the future salvation and restoration of Israel in God's program is cancelled, and so is God's promised blessing for the whole world through the Abrahamic covenant, mentioned in Genesis 12. The fourth issue, such false teaching also prevents Christians from obeying the manifold commandments of Scripture addressed to those who await the coming of Christ. Practical instructions given in the light of Christ's return, such as be watchful, live soberly, meaning reasonably, righteously and godly, these are of no importance to those who believe that his coming has already passed. I'll conclude with the blessed words written to all of us as an advance in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15 to 18. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I do believe, my dear friends, that this applies to the Bible prophecy. Let us not be deceived in the last days. Praise God for what he has revealed to us today through his word. God bless all of us to delve deeper into the scripture. Let us pay close attention to Bible prophecy, that we may love the prophetic word, that it may shine in our hearts as a ray of God's light, something that is written by Apostle Peter. Praise God, and let God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>